Oh, uh, there is a trial by fire this morning. Uh, if it's not for y'all, it's for all of us and everything else going on. But uh, I'm glad you're here. Does anybody want to be tried by fire? Ooh. Oh, that's so silent. You should be. <laughs> I know y'all are scared because of last week. It's okay. Uh, this week will be uh, different. But um, yeah. Let's, uh, let, let's pray. I'm ready to get to work, and um, the devil is fighting this church this morning. He's fighting me this morning. Um, let's just pray real quick. Jesus, we thank you for the ability to get here this morning. Whether someone drove us or we drove ourselves, whether we walked in the building or we were rolled in the building or limped in the building, we are here for you. To seek your word, to know your word, to hear your word, to learn your word, but most importantly, to live your word. Amen. God, I, I, I decree and I declare right now in Jesus' name that every evil spirit that's coming against us, that's coming against our health and our building, in our schools, in our nation, in our leaders, have to flee. I speak it now. That there will be a revival. That this is not the end. We will be tried by fire. And we will come through on the other side looking like gold. Ooh, if that's speaking to you this morning, say amen. High five seven people and be seated. Uh, Y'all, as soon as last week ended... Don't start my timer yet. I'm going to be on a timer today. I know last weekend was super long, and sometimes I have a timer, sometimes I don't. Listen, uh, we, I looked it up this week. My first sermon up here that I preached to you was September 15th. No, 18th. 18th. I looked it up. Okay, I have access to the YouTube, and I uploaded it. I know what it is. I'm just kidding. I have a very particular filing system with dates. No, I looked it up, um, 17, 18, whatever, day apart. It says 18 online. Um, That was my first sermon. So I'm still working this out. So um, I apologize somewhat for taking an hour and 48 minutes last week. But I said somewhat apologize because I do value your time, but it was a word that we all needed, uh, myself included. I went back. I'm not used to you being there. (laughs) I went back and watched it, and I was crying. So... If y'all didn't get fed, I got fed and then spoke it and then got fed again, so I'm full. But I knew uh, as soon as that ended uh, that this weekend was going to be fun because my entire house got sick and uh, I started feeling sick. I knew as soon as they did, I'm like, here we go. It's not going to come on me until like Friday or Saturday and lo and behold... Uh, Actually, my throat feels a little bit better. It's probably like the seven bags of tea I drank this morning to try to get up here. Uh, And then we started, and live stream wasn't working because there was a power surge, so we're on now, but uh, I promise I'm going to stick to an hour. I know last week I said um, that this would be four weeks if we don't get through everything that I want to get through today. I'm going to cut it off, and we will come back next week. That way, because I do value your time. I, it's, it sounds fun, but I don't want to do two hours every week, you know? But, hey, maybe. We'll see what Jesus does, all right? How about that? That's all I'm going to promise. Let me, uh, we're going to be, as you know, if this is your first time, that was probably just the weirdest introduction that you've ever seen in a sermon. Before we get going, and I'm glad we're on live stream now, uh, we have a lady that's been coming for some time, and that's not going to stick. Uh, oof, this is a mess. Uh, Miss Connie, I don't know if you're watching. I hope she is. Uh, she's been having some health issues and was having trouble <laughs> being convinced to go to the ER. I'll leave it at that. We actually, this is just, I, w- I want y'all to see how awesome God is. Um, so she was having some, tra- some health issues, wasn't going to the ER. We prayed uh, a few Thursdays ago at our music practice at the end. We prayed for her that she would get to the ER. The next day, she actually went to the ER and found out <laughs> what some place originally called a sinus infection, 
was uh, uh, she had a detached retina, uh, full-blown leukemia, and a brain bleed. So, um, yeah, that's not a sinus infection. But luckily, by the grace of God, she moved uh, Georgia, right? Jack, where did I get Georgia from? Well, Jacksonville is close enough to Georgia. Either way, she went where she needed to go, and they scheduled her for surgery, I believe, and just before the surgery, if I, hopefully I'm saying this right, if not, Preacher Liberties. <laughs> um, apparently someone like messaged them, hey, you're, you're not gonna need the surgery. Jesus is gonna heal you. You're not gonna need, Jesus is gonna be your surgeon kind of thing. And right before, actually a few minutes after they got that text, they came in and said, hey, we don't have to do surgery anymore. Your eye has been healed. Um, yes, glory to God. Um, and then what else was it? Her, the brain bleeding, I think, stopped. And her blood clots, everything's kind of on the men's now. So God is a healer. And I'm believing it this morning. I feel so bad complaining about a sore throat, but it is what it is. Uh, if you're joining us, I'm Pastor Jared. I don't like saying that, but uh, my dad is the lead pastor. You saw him, the queer cut. <laughs> Whoa. Is he in here? <laughs> I tried to say, I tried to say creepy bald guy. And you know what's funny? Like the main thing too, one of my main things in the message today is slowing down. And all of that is because I'm not slowing down. Um, that's your lead pastor currently uh, until he decides to retire. Uh, if you're joining us, this is week two, episode two of a series I started last week called Committed, just about being committed. That's the creepy bald guy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where do you go from there? Anyways, uh, so last week we started, we started week one, committed a series on the life of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles. We did chapter 17. This week we're doing 18. Last week was renewal. Um, I spoke and just tried to lay the foundation of the, the necessary need an urgency for revival, um, not just in this nation, but in our own lives, to be broken and stirred up by the Spirit and you know, tried by fire, because we can pray for revival all we want. If we're not doing anything in ourselves and, and getting fed ourselves, where's the revival? So this weekend, or this week, well, this weekend, um, I actually got hate mail right, to, right before I came out for you know, the doctrine of man and, and not doing this on the, the Sabbath, which apparently is Saturday. Uh, even though it can be any day that you want. And uh, y'all remember I talked about the letter J thing last week? They brought that up too. So, you know, shout out to that guy on the St. Augustine News Facebook. I'm just gonna still talk about Jesus. Last week was renewal. This week is relapse. Committed part two, relapse. Uh, yeah, Second Chronicles 18. I'm gonna read one through... 11, and we'll go from there. Can we stand for the wording of the word this, this week? I know y'all got lazy last week because I gave you a break, but uh, geez, Tyler, I'm glad, I'm glad you're excited about it. Did you trip or are you just that eager to be a distraction again? <laughs> if this is your first time, I have a very dry sense of humor, so if I sound rude, I, I promise it's all in, in love and he's a loser. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Starting in verse one, now, everybody say now. Yeah. Now, Jehoshaphat. You remember what happened last week? After he set his heart towards God and tore down the high places and, and tore down all the nasty stuff and they were seeking God and they saw revival and he was blessed. Now, Jehoshaphat had great wealth and honor and he allied himself with Ahab. Y'all know King Ahab, not a good guy, <clears throat> by marriage. Some years later, he went down to see Ahab in Samaria. Ahab slaughtered many sheep and cattle for him. And the people with him urged him to attack Ramoth Gilead. Now, the reason for that is this actually originally belonged to Judah. Um, and Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah at this time. They are uh, the nation of Israel split into two factions. You have the northern kingdom, which is King Ahab, no good people up there, uh, and Judah, which is Jehoshaphat, semi-decent people down there, 
They're trying. The north has all but given up. Uh, And this is actually Ahab from the north that wants to get this place back, even though it originally belonged to Judah. Verse 3, Ahab, king of Israel, asked Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied, I am as you are, my people, as your people. We will join you in the war. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. Mm. Amen. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, 400 men, and asked them, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I not? Go, they answered, for God will give it into the king's hand. Yeah, and this isn't really like something in the text that's too crazy, but I like to look at words. Uh, You notice Jehoshaphat wants to seek the counsel of the Lord. They said, God will give it into your hands. Uh, And and something that just stood out to me, and it's nothing like crazy going on with the original language, but he's got to be your Lord, not just your God. There's, There's plenty of people that believe in God that do absolutely nothing to follow him, and he is not their Lord. Jesus is not their Lord. So he's got to be your Lord, not just your God. Verse six, but Jehoshaphat asked, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord whoo, of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, there is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord. Oh, dear Jesus, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. That pastor's so mean, and I don't like when he preaches because all he does is yell at us. He is Jared, son of Phil. He is Micaiah, son of Imla. Oh, somebody's going to clip that up. He put himself in the Bible. I'm ready. The king should not say such a thing, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called uh, one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imla, at once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the, by the entrance of the gate of Samaria with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Canaan, had made iron horns. He's making a show out of it. And he declared, this is what the Lord says, lies. With these, you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. I'm going to stop in verse 11. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious. They said, they said, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Woo! This week, are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Let's get warmed up to talk back now. Come on. My throat hurts. I want to I preach with y'all, not just at you. Let's get one more time. Jesus, thank you so much. I pray, Lord, right now, hijack this service just like last week. I am your vessel. I am your vessel. Give me me fire. Give me passion. Give me the anointing to preach this as you spoke it to me, God. I pray it strikes all of our hearts, even those online, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Speak Holy Spirit. Has anybody ever found themselves in trouble just by going along with the wrong crowd? Show of hands. Should be like 100% of us. Yeah. Never a good thing. Well, we see here uh, that Jehoshaphat seemingly... I thought it was raining. That would have been beautiful. (laughs) Seemingly, uh, just after he dedicates himself and his nation to the Lord, all of a sudden he kind of seems to fall into a relapse, a setback. Uh, of allying himself with someone that he has no business allying himself with. And we see that he had great wealth and honor, but he allies himself to Ahab by marriage. He is blessed, but he's blessed because he sought God. He sought God. He got blessed. They got gifts. They got provision and everything. Uh, but he has a big butt in the way. Does anybody have a big butt in the way? Because his big butt is that he compromised. 
He's compromising himself and the nation by allying with someone he has no business being allied with. He's allying with apostasy because since he's so afraid of conflict, like many of us are, we try to skirt around the bush and step on eggshells and not speak to people uh, and not confront their sin and not try to convict people of their sin. Well, not try to, I don't want to say our job to convict them of their sin. Our job to bring their sin to light and let the Holy Spirit convict them. I want to work that out and make sure that's not getting twisted. Uh, so actually what has happened is Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram, has married Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. Does anybody know Jezebel? Yeah. Way worse than Ahab. And literally just because of this, just because of this, and, and they did it for the, the political alliance. A, or, uh, I'm sorry, Jehoshaphat does it because he's scared of conflict. Ahab does it because previously... And I didn't read it last week. At the end of chapter 17, he has over a million soldiers now ready to go to war. So Ahab's looking to get his resources but not have a true relationship with him. And that's how some of us are when we get unequally yoked. We want to try to think we can lead these people to Jesus, and, and maybe we can, but so often it leads us into compromise because... You, you, you know, you've got one person in a relationship that knows God's authority, that trusts God's authority, that believes his word, and then you have another person in the relationship that doesn't understand it or just outright rejects it. And eventually what happens is when you're unequally yoked with these people, it, it leads to temptation to compromise. Um, thank you. Because at some point, um, ladies, if, if you're coming to church and your husband's not, Eventually, you're going to get tired of nagging him and trying to drag him here. You're going to get tired of the comments, and then you're going to start slipping and not inviting him anymore, and then you're not going to end up going as much anymore and as often anymore, and eventually, you're going to find yourself compromising your own beliefs simply because you're trying to avoid the conflict that is within your household from being unequally yoked. Now, this is not to say to just disconnect yourself from people and stop trying to reach them. Jesus, we know he sat down, ate with sinners, he ate with the tax collectors, all the nasty people and the prostitutes that we would deem nasty. Not, he sees them as people. I, yeah, that sounded weird when I said it, but I want to, you know, he views them as people. That's why he had compassion on them. He views them as people. That's why he had compassion on them. And that's the importance of not being unequally yoked to make sure that you are seeking God first and foremost in your life. And statistically, in a family, and this is what I was asking you about the other day, in a family, if a child comes to Christ first, only a 5% chance that their family, his or her family, I want to say their, and somebody thinks I'm pronoun and, uh, their family only has a 5% chance of coming to Christ. As a mother, if you come to Christ first, there's a 22% chance that your family will go behind you. Almost one in four, not quite. You're struggling hard to get your mans to get his stuff together and get in church. Uh, as a father, men, and if you're on the fence, if you come to Christ first, there is a 93% chance that your family will follow you. So it is important to live biblically, to stand up for what is right biblically, because it's, it, you're either hindering your family or you're helping your family. And all of that is a decision. I mean, just like we say, at the end of this age, heaven or hell, it's your choice. Jesus laid the groundwork. And for the people who say that God's an angry God, why did he make hell? He didn't make hell for people. Hell was for the fallen angels, for the demons, for Satan. We're choosing that over God. And I feel like I got to ask this, and it had no intention of saying this, but I heard it in a video this week, and it's a very heavy message, heavy question. Um, what do you think will be the number one regret of people in hell? Just think about it. What do you think will be the number one regret? That they're there. That, well, yes, that they're there. But <laughs> you've got a long, 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 long time to think about it. 
disconnected from God, disjointed from God, not where you're supposed to be, not where you were born to be, where you were created to be? Are they going to get more angry at God? Probably for a time. But eventually, it's just going to settle down into just deep-seated just regret. And to live with, I mean, have you ever lived with regret? And it just eats you inside? Imagine not having any way to release that. Not having any way to write that. To correct it and change it. Because it's just set and you're done. But... Jehoshaphat, he's blessed, but, right? Y'all quiet, or you, you wanna, come on. He's blessed, but see, the, the problem is, so he's, he's, he's blessed, he's got great wealth and honor, and then verse two, some years later, it's easy, because we just step right into this, and we're like, okay, now Jehoshaphat has great wealth, and some years later, we're reading it, after the fact that he has lived it out. This is like looking at your testimony now and wondering what's supposed to happen in in 5, 10, 15 years, but you're trying to base your perception on what you see right now. He had to live this out. And the thing is that we, like Jehoshaphat, we get stuff and we just stop. We get get a little bit of blessing. That's good. God, you know, he, he gave me a new car. I got AC back in my truck. Hallelujah for the Lord for that. And we just stop. We just stop, and we get stagnant. We let our stuff make us stagnant. We get a little blessing from God, a little provision from God, and then we start backing off a little bit because, hey, he answered my prayer to help me get out of this debt. He answered my prayer to help get me a little bit more finances. He answered my prayer to make my business get built up, but now I'm good. Now I'm good. I don't really need to do anything. And we get stagnant, and we get stale, and we say... (laughs) <laughs> we say we're content, but really we're just complacent. They're similar. They're similar. I had to write down for all the people not from St. Augustine the differences. Contentment is a feeling of joy and peace in a current situation while still striving for improvement. God, thank you for this, but what do you want me to do with it? God, thank you for giving me my house. How can I help steward it? Thank you for my family. How can I bring them into a deeper relationship with you, Lord? Thank you for the friends that are in my life. How can I reach them through Jesus, for Jesus? How can I share this? Thank you for the provision. How can I bless somebody with this? Y'all real quiet now. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've given me. How can I, since you are pouring into me, how can I use that to pour back out into someone else? And the reason is because complacency. And complacency is being satisfied with the current situation. They're similar. But even when you know there's room for improvement, you don't make any effort to improve. And I know right here somebody's like, oh, see, I knew. It's all about what you do for Jesus. It's all about doing something else. No. Christ's work on the cross is finished. Nothing you can add to it, nothing you can subtract from it. There is nothing greater than the fact that our God, your God, your Lord and Savior came down. I'm preaching better than y'all thinking. He came down out of eternal glory and was beaten and mocked, stripped naked, spit on. Do you know, do y'all remember the story of the sponge that I shared on Easter, how disgusting that was? The sour wine, for those of you that don't know, the sour wine that they stuck on the end of the the sponge to put in his mouth, that sponge was used as uh, toilet paper for the Roman soldiers. So the very final words of your Lord and Savior were spoken with the taste of human excrement in his mouth. Can you do that? For someone you love. And now do it for someone who hates your guts, would rather see you die And they will never like you. They will always reject you. And you still did it. That is love. And we take that and we're just, uh, yes, it's a great gift. 
But Jesus saves us, and then we do nothing to share it with people. We do nothing with trying to reach people. It's almost like, I've got this great thing in eternal life, but I want you to go to hell. Tell me I'm wrong. I know that sounds heavy, and that's not fun, and it's probably not getting preached uh, in several churches in this city, because it's not happy-go-lucky, come get your coffee, but... That's reality. If you're not sharing it with Jesus, or if you're not sharing Jesus with other people, you're pretty much just condemning them to eternal damnation and saying, bump you, go to hell. This is only for me. We've made, <laughs> we've made Christ and salvation self-centered, made it about us. That's why there's so many churches in America right now preaching me, 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 you, 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 instead of Jesus. Instead of Jesus. Just simply, just walking through the Bible Verse by verse, however you want to do it, but speaking the, un, the unrated, unaltered word of God Amen. that holds reference over everything that we could say, but we don't take it seriously enough and we just breeze through it so it can be a devotional instead of devoting our lives to living it out and following it and putting it in practice, we settle for complacency instead of contentment. God, thank you for this, but what can I do with it now? Because if, if God gives and God take, takes away with Job, can you imagine if, uh, let, let's, let, think of it like how you would think of it with your kids. Hey, I'm going to give you this toy. If you're not going to play with it, we're throwing it away. Here's a new car. Go use it to spread the gospel. Here's a house. Use it to invite homeless people into your home and share just a meal. You don't even have to preach to them yet. Just give them the love and grace of Jesus like you're doing. Showing them the love and, and the, the hope of Jesus. Just being a light in the darkness. Being that salt. Can you imagine if he was like, this is what I want you to use it for. And you were like, no, I, I like it just to watch Netflix till 10 p.m. And he's like, okay. Okay and it burns down. That would be horrible. And thank God he's not like us. Y'all should have shouted, thank God he's not like us. Because there'd be about three people in this room because everybody else would get mad at someone and it would be like Bruce Almighty and you'd just be shooting them down with lightning bolts out of your hands looking like, Darth, was it Darth Sidious or whatever from Star Wars? So it, that, that's the problem is we've gotten complacent in our walk with Christ, and it has led to so much compromise. That's why we have watered-down gospel that's too afraid to say things that are out of the Bible and just let it sit. Just let it sit. That's why we want to be entertained, and we need churches that got to have motocross and backflips and doing all this stuff, and not that there's anything wrong with an illustration, but we've made it more about the picture instead of the provision of Jesus Christ. We've made it more about just how something can look instead of just the love and the grace of our holy king. We've made it about needing to feed our flesh instead of living by faith. Because we're not walking by faith, we're walking by feelings. We're letting our feelings get in the way. I'll, I'll lift my hands when I feel like it in worship. I don't really feel good today, so I, maybe I'll just watch live stream. Oh, the live stream's messing up. Well, I'll just catch it next week. And you live five minutes down the road instead of coming into the building. And we want to be entertained. We want to be spoiled. We want things to light up. We love to go to the, the concerts and the football games and the baseball games and shout and scream and buy $47 cans of Bud Light and hot dogs. But 10% back to the church? Man. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But, it, but, we, but we've gotten complacent. But we've gotten complacent. We, don't, we, need, we, we need something more than just the word. We gotta, the preacher's got to bring it to life. And I'm all for exegeting the scripture and pulling it out and, and bringing it into today because I can tell you all about stuff that happened 2,000 plus years ago, but if I don't put it into context of where you're living today, you're going to walk out of here confused. So there is a healthy balance that we have to, to navigate of, 
I need to teach you this, but I also need you to understand how it applies to your life because it is the living, breathing, active word of God. It's not just a history book. That's why you can read this and know what's going on in the world, know what's going on in your life, know how to apply it to your life, know how to pray it over your life, know how to use it to change your life because God will use it. It's his words and he will use the Holy Spirit to give you revelation and show you how it applies to your life. And the reason I called this relapse is because we see even after Jehoshaphat has moved forward and he's making the right steps and you're coming to church and you're making the right steps and you've given your life to Jesus and you're making the right steps, there's still something that comes up down the road that maybe has led you to, comp- maybe that you didn't even realize was going on, you didn't realize it was a compromise. And you've had this relapse where you've just kind of fallen back into your old ways. You were on fire for God, but now it's more like, you know, the candle is kind of going out and it's just a little bit there or it's a little matchstick. And we've got to put that kindling back on it and get the fire stirred back up within you so that you can walk out of here and share that light. So some years later, after the revival, after the renewal, After God has revived you and brought you out of your sin, some time has passed. And the honeymoon is over. And you're like, man, that was great church on Sunday and Monday's smacking you in the face, going back to a job you hate, trying to pay bills that you hate even more, (laughs) just trying to trudge through life and reality has smacked you back in the face even though you just had your revival. But you need to understand, you need to know, and you have to realize, you have to ask yourself, are you, are you still as in love and committed to Jesus, to God, as you were when you made the decision to follow him? Because it's easy to stir up your feelings and get you to look at yourself and realize We're all pieces of garbage, and it is only by the grace of God that we are saved. It is only by him that we are spotless. We are all sinners at heart. We have a sinful nature. I know right now someone on the internet wants to say, well, no, you know, once saved, always saved kind of things, and it doesn't matter. I'm inherently good. You know, I'm not a bad person. I don't murder people. You know, I might cuss every other word, but I'm not, I'm not killing people. I'm not stealing from them. I'm a, I'm a good person. We're not. We're none of us. Not me. I'll be the first to admit. (laughs) I was a little heavy on the response there, Kels. But it's easy. It's easy to stir your feelings up. It's easy to get you to make a decision based on your feelings. And that's why I want to ask you today, after, when revival comes, after revival comes, And after the feelings of revival are gone, is the faith from revival still going to be there? Or will it crumble because you fell to your knees because of how you felt in that moment? Your life was falling apart. You were being crushed. You were being broken and pressed down. You were driven to your knees because of depression, because of your financial situation, because your family's falling apart, because your wife found out you did something really stupid and you're, you know, mm, kicked out of the house. All your clothes are in the front lawn. And, you know, you, you came up and, oh, God, I'm sorry, but you're really not sorry for doing it. You're sorry you got caught. Does it happen to Ahab before? He would go throw temper tantrums and go sit and cry in bed. And he wouldn't make a repentant heart. But I need you to understand, ask yourself, when the feelings are, because all of this will fade. When you get out of here and it feels good and it stirs you up and you feel the presence of God, you feel the Holy Spirit. When you go back to work, what are you gonna do? Does it just dissipate? Does it disappear? Or do you continue? Do you continue in your faith? Or do you continue with your feelings? That's why you walk by feelings. Or walk by faith. That's what, yeah. You're walking by feelings because if you keep your eyes open, you can see when you're about to fall off of the stage. You walk by feelings because when you're driving in traffic, you want to make sure nothing cuts you off. 
You walk by feelings because, you know, I'm feeling kind of sick. I don't want to go to church today. I don't want to lift my hands. I walk by feelings because I'm scared somebody's going to hear me sing. I walk by feelings because I'm scared of what they're going to think my voice sounds like. I walk by feelings because I'm scared if I lift my arms, do I have yellow stains on my t-shirt? I walk by feelings because did I put deodorant on this morning? I walk by feelings. I walk by feelings because my wife says she wants a divorce. I walk by feelings, not mine, this is general. <laughs> Y'all be like, oh. <laughs> I walk by feelings because my kids haven't come home in three weeks and they're on a bender. I walk by feelings because I moved away from my family. I move away from my past and I'm walking by my feelings. What I can see, how I can control it. Ooh, yeah, that's it right there. It's about control, the relapse, the setback is because we're trying to control the outcome of our own lives. We're trying to control what God wants to do in our lives. We want to control everything, and y'all want to act like you're high and mighty, you've never done it, praying like, God, take this away right now. If you'll just take this away right now, if you'll just give me a million dollars right now, I'll write the check for the church. If you give me two million dollars, I'll write the check for the church and take my family out to lunch. Dollar menu. God, if you do it now, I promise I'll do this. Can you do it now? And it's like you're, you're, you're trying to control something that God is trying to give you the, the character development for the next stage of your life. And you're not going to have what you need there when you're too busy trying to control where you're at right here. That's right. That's right. So we get complacent and it leads us to compromise and then we relapse into needing to control. Control because we're worrying about everything. We're worrying about everything. And I don't know if this is 100% sound, but I heard something in a sermon to, uh, this week, and it really, really spoke to me that worry. And again, I don't know if this is 100%, but it spoke to me. Worry is a sin against God. It is telling him that you trust yourself more than his provision and his hand over your life. And it's something we all do. Right now, half of you are worrying if I'm going to finish in the next 30 minutes or the next 47 minutes plus an hour and a half, and then we'll come back and take a sabbatical and finish up after dinner time while the youth are doing church. Jehoshaphat was scared. So he tried to control this situation. He tried to control the conflict that was coming against him by marrying his son to Ahab's daughter. Which sounds terrible enough because we know who Jezebel was. We know who Ahab was. If you don't, go home and study it. I don't even want to get into all that nastiness. But the apple did not fall far from the tree. Their daughter was exactly the same. And the sad situation and the importance of pouring yourself out and leading your family to the gospel and leading your family to Christ and knowing and putting these things in them, the importance of being present in their life is the fact that Jehoshaphat's son, even though he did good in the eyes of the Lord, Jehoram followed the ways of Ahab. That's in your Bible, chapter 21. Because of the influence of their daughter, completely through Jehoshaphat and God out of the window. It is literally this alliance that brings the downfall of Judah in the future. Because she leads Jehoram to bring in the bad practices, the pagan stuff. And then when, when he dies and their son dies, I'm trying to make, I've, there's so much. Anyway, she ends up taking the throne at some point in the future. And it's just downfall. There goes everything out the window. The battle of good versus evil. Good versus, not just people, the spiritual battle of good versus evil. The need for us to be on our knees praying that fire and revival comes back to this nation because they were split. They all knew it, but it fell so far and you get the northern kingdom where it's one generation starts slipping. You think of it, uh, like Exodus in Egypt. They were there for 400 years. And you've got the ones who came 
And then you've got their generation and the next generation and the next generation. And now you have a perpetual mindset of slavery because of the amount of time that they spent in it. The downfall that comes from not being devoted to God. The downfall that came to the north because they started rejecting God and never, complete, and, and never completely returned. They never went back to seeking God first. The downfall of the northern kingdom slips into the southern kingdom and brings the downfall of Judah simply because they compromised, because they got complacent. And they ally themselves with people they should not be allied with. Commitment. Are you committed? Are the feelings of revival going to fade? And is your faith still going to be there? Because commitment is staying true to what you said long after the mood that you said it in has left. That's why when you're standing in front of your significant other on your wedding day, you say, for better or worse. That's why there's such an attack on relationships and marriages in this country now. Because you can go out anywhere on any app and find anyone. I don't care if it's Tinder, Bumble. I don't know any of them. Grinder. <laughs> There's real hell out there and y'all going to get mad at me for bringing stuff up that you probably have secretly on your phone next to your Bible app. I can go look at Psalms or Proverbs or I can type in Pornhub and decide, choose this day who you're going to serve. Christian Mingle. Not that there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying you can find someone at any point in time and there's this just attack on being committed to stuff now because you can just quit whenever you want. No matter what it is. Oh, girl, he's too, you're too good for him. He don't deserve you. Get out of there. Oh, she don't let you come out with us anymore. Well, yeah, because you're going out to the bar every stinking night of the week. Or probably because you're spending half your paycheck buying rounds of shots for the entire bar when you get there because (laughs) you have no self-esteem that you need someone's outside input thinking you look cool because you're buying somebody else all the stuff that they need. That's why they disappear when you're not at the bar buying them shots anymore because they weren't there for you. They were there because you were buying them things. Commitment. Are we committed? Are we committed? Will we be committed or are we going to just walk by our feelings and if it stirs us up in worship we'll lift our hands are we going to praise him when we don't feel good are we going to praise him when our throat is a little dry are we going to praise him when we sound like a dying donkey are we going to praise him when everything in our life is falling apart or are we going to put ourselves on his throne and say you know what God you're worthy but I'm just not going to give it to you because I don't really feel like it right now my God, can you imagine if Jesus was going to the cross? He's like, I changed my mind. I'm not really feeling it, guys. I'm sorry. Better luck. Stick to the law. Y'all don't, y'all don't think about this stuff. Jesus gave his life for you. Let's take a quick poll. Did, <laughs> y'all ready to get real? Did anybody say a bad word this week? Say a bad word this week. Did anybody... Okay. Uh, Did you get angry in traffic? Okay. The rest of y'all that didn't raise your hands, did you say a lie this week? Because you just did it in church. I won't go too deep because we don't need to expose all kinds of stuff. But let's just be real. We probably got mad. We got angry. We made a head of argument. We met a head of fight. Said some stuff, stuff we didn't mean. We don't. Kelsey and I don't fight. We have uncomfortable disagreements. <laughs> but by your own admission, that's not a lie. It's a. It's a. By your own admission, by our own admission, we've all sinned in some way this week. Let's get more real. Was it more than once? Okay, imagine every time that you sinned. Every time. Anybody have pets? 
Imagine you had to kill an animal. Oh, did y'all think there was only a New Testament? <laughs> you had to kill an animal every time you sin. Some of y'all are now going to your neighbors, taking their pets, trying to atone for your sin because you've run out of animals. You're going to Little Caesars out in Hastings trying to get all the stray cats. There's no more stray cats. There's no more stray dogs. If every time you sinned, you had to kill an animal, and we no longer have to do that because the lamb that was slain before, before the creation of the earth came down and died for our sins. And not that it is about us, because he didn't have to. So are we mm, committed or not? Because Jehoshaphat, he was committed, but he's making some stumbles here. And he's messing up. And he's allied with the wrong thing. And, 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 and you look at this, and Ahab brings him down, or he goes there, Ahab gets him up. He's like, will you go to war with me? With me against Ramoth. Did anyone see in those first three verses God being mentioned? No, he's trying to go to war without a word. He's trying to go to war without a word. He's trying to go to work without a word. He's trying to go to church without a word. He's trying to go out into the world without a word. How often are you seeking first the kingdom of God? Before everything that you do. The, and in the, in, the, in the Bible, when Jesus says that, seek first the kingdom of God, that comes after he's talking about anxiety and worrying about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. And he mentions the birds. Did anybody look at a bird? They don't have a savings account. They don't have a bank, but they still eat. And we worry about it. Relapsing into wanting control. Because we're, 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 we're relapsing and we need the control because we're rejecting God's sovereignty. I trust God with my soul, but is he really going to meet my needs? I've got 50 bucks in my bank account. If I give this in faith, how am I going to feed my family when we get home? Are we going to go to bed hungry? Or am I going to put this down in faith and say, God, I trust you to feed me, to provide for me, to meet me where I need you. And somewhere, somebody at the same time, you're having that struggle. God is sending them with a bag of groceries to your door to meet your needs. But we reject him. Oh, I'm nowhere near that. We have to speed up. Nope, I'm not. You get an hour. You're going to come back wanting more. And I, and I love it that he goes there and Ahab slaughters many sheep and cattle for him. Now, God's people, as we just talked about, they would sacrifice and the word slaughter is used, but it's always mentioned where it's going to. They did it for God. They sacrificed this for God. Moses slaughtered such and such for God. It was all for God. But in here, Ahab is so disconnected of who he's supposed to be, who he's supposed to be following, that he's making a sacrifice to another man. God wants you to sacrifice to him. Satan will always make you slaughter something for yourself. Satan will lead you into things that look good, but that ultimately bring your demise. When you look at this passage and you see he throws this big Ahab, throws this big extravagant party for Jehoshaphat. And that's cool and that's fancy and it looks nice and there's sound and there's lights and there's haze and there's fog and everything's blending together nice, but it's great. But don't let flattery fool your faith. Because it fooled his. Just because somebody wants to butter you up and give you all this stuff 
and try to bribe their way into your life. Don't compromise your values. Don't compromise your values. Y'all out here, you're single girls out here. Uh Uh-oh. You're like, oh, I met this really nice guy, and he says he loves Jesus. No, he's just trying to get in your pants, okay? Oh, y'all like, move on, move on. No, see, you've got to call this stuff out. I get it. You got your boyfriend and your girlfriend, and y'all been living together, and I'm not going to condemn you, but I will tell you, it's compromise. It's sin. That's not how God wants you to live. It is for the confines of marriage between man and woman. Nothing else. One man and one woman. Some of y'all might have had some crazy password. There might have been some different numbers going on, but that was sin too, and we needed to stick to one and done. And he says, oh, Go to war with me. I'm still stuck on that. Go to war with me. Me. Not, well, God is leading us here. Can we take this back for God? Can we show these people who God is? No, go to war with me. Help me get this stuff. How often do we do this? We go without the word that we need to be asking. We'll get a flat tire. We got a flat tire the other day on, on the camper coming home. And it's frustrating But how often do you look around and you're like, okay, God, why here? Why now? Because I can get mad. I can cuss a tire out all day long. But if I'm sitting here and I'm seeking God, what did you what did you stop me here for? What did you make me pull into this gas station for? Because the light came on. Is there a single mother over there that can't her car's not working that you could bless? Is there is there a hazard up on the road ahead? That it had you still been on the road, you might not even be here in this room right now. But we don't seek God like that. We're just like, why is this going on? Again? I've replaced every tire on this stinking camper now. How is this happening? Again, we just bought this one. But what are you protecting me from that I don't know? Because you're a good father, and a good father cares for his children, and he looks out for his children, and he stands for his children. But we don't. Oh, in verse 4, Jehoshaphat. Yes, but. Yes, but. Some of y'all stop right on the yes. Hey, you want to go out here? Yeah. Hey, you want to go to the bar? Yeah. Hey, you want to go to the movies? Yeah. You're not like, hold on, let me check. God, is this a good person to connect with? Is this a good place to go? Should I suggest a different place to go to? Should I suggest a different group of friends to meet with? How can I minister to this person so I don't fall into apathy and apostasy because I'm unequally yoked with the wrong people that I should be in? And instead, God, how can I set my heart more on you and be more holy for you and share you more to the world? God, what are you wanting me to see? What are you wanting me to see? Seek First, the counsel of God. (sighs) Seek for, ask God first. Do we even do this? Do we? We had, uh, where we live, used to be a sod farm. This means when it rains, it's wet and soft and it's not fun so everybody's got rain boots on just to walk through the yard when it's raining so shout out got, send another like drought for just a month so my driveway will dry up Kelsey the other day she asked me to <laughs> take uh, this like gymnastics bar that the girls have and go take it to the outside shed and grab some meat out of the freezer or something I don't remember um so I was like, okay, cool, and I stopped, and I got you know, my boots on because I was thinking, okay, I know it's wet. It's been raining. If I put Crocs on here, I'm going to be standing in shin-deep water. So let me, I know what's coming ahead, and I'm smart. So I'm going to put my boots on so I don't have to worry about getting my feet wet. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I go out there, and I'm grabbing the meat, and I'm like, man, that would be a good sermon point. I'm like, 
knowing the terrain that's ahead and being prepared and stopping, seeking God first. And I was seeking God about my boots, but you get the example. Slowing down and just being like, okay, what do I need for what I'm about to step into? I'm like, man, that will preach. And I got all the way over there and I was like, oh, I forgot the gymnastics bar. (laughs) So I'm like, okay, cool. So then I'm like, well, that'll preach. Slowing down. You got to make sure you got everything that you need. So I went back the second time and I made sure that everything was lined up. I propped the door open. I put my boots facing out so I didn't have to turn around trying to back up like this and putting them in. And I made sure everything was lined up. So that way, when I took what I already should have had in the first place, y'all ain't catching on yet. When I took what I should have had in the first place and was set up for knowing where I was going, I just slipped right into what I needed for the terrain that I was about to get into. If you knew the power of the Holy Spirit that is within you, you would already be traversing the terrain with what you needed. You would already be walking in boldness. You would already be walking in courage. You would already be walking equipped with what you need to go out into the world. Y'all are a whole lot less excited about Jesus than I am. You're wondering why your life ain't changing, but you're not sitting down with Christ every night before bed. You're wondering why your day sucks and you're starting it with a sorry mentality going to work instead of stepping back and going, I'm in charge of my joy. The devil didn't give it to me. People didn't give it to me, so they can't take it away. So I'm going to take a moment and slow down and seek God and read my Bible, and I'm going to make the point that I am not ending this day in anger. I am not ending this day in bitterness. I am not ending this day in depression. I am not ending this day in sickness. I am not ending this day in lack. I am not ending this day sad. I'm going to slow down and seek God. Slow down and seek God. He gets (laughs) he gets 400 people. 400. I think I said this last week that this is almost certainly The 400 prophets of Asherah from 1 Kings 18, when Elijah met them on Mount Carmel, only the prophets of Baal showed up. I know a lot of times in church, we make the mistake and we've gotten into the habit of saying that all 850 were there. Only the 450 showed up. The 400 didn't go. This could be them, could be a different set. Either way, what these are most likely is hired people to tell him what he wants to hear. What he wants to hear. That's why you've got all these lukewarm churches too afraid to stand up in front of you and say words that might make you angry, but maybe you'll remember that enough and a seed will get planted so you'll go back and watch it again and understand the reality and the truth behind the message, but you're too hung up on how the vessel looks that gave it to you instead of the voice of the one who gave it to them to pour it out into you. You need people in your life to be able to tell you no. If you're only looking for a yes, you're in the wrong place, and you're immature. You need somebody that knows how to say no and say it with their chest. Somebody that can shoulder check you and be like, no, dummy, you shouldn't go do that. No, you don't need to buy another handle for the second time this week. No, you don't need to be spending all of your money on that stuff. No, you don't need to be looking at OnlyFans. No, you don't need to be reading those type of books. No, you don't need to be looking at tarot cards. No, you don't need to be looking at crystals. No, you don't need to be worrying about if there's more than one gender because there's only two. No, you don't need to be worrying about how can I make this gospel fit a little bit more comfortably into my lifestyle instead of realizing that Jesus already set it forth in this book and if it says it in there, we should be doing it. But I know we're all so perfect, and we follow all of this, and there's no way that we pick and choose things, right? It's a good thing he lived the perfect life, so I don't have to, so you don't have to. And this 400 prophets, 
false prophets, telling him what he wants to hear, not what he needs to hear. This is why he says, I hate him, because he says all bad stuff about me. It's all bad. The preacher is still yelling at me. 400 yes men. Listen to me. You need, (laughs) with all that's on the internet right now, and all of the fun stuff that they can show you and tell you how the letter J didn't exist until the 1500s. And that's not Jesus' name. And Jesus wasn't a white man. And no, it's not white man's religion. You need to be where the prophets who are in it for the prophets. The prophets that are in it for the prophets. The ones that are compromising the word of God and sprinkling in just enough truth so it might sound good, but when you test them against the scriptures, they crumble and they fall apart because nothing can stand against the mighty and the majestic and the magnificent word of God. They will fall apart. And that, mm, that is why Jehoshaphat knows Seven minutes, y'all. We're going to wrap this up quick. Unless y'all want a little more time. (sighs) Jehoshaphat, he knows something is off. You cannot, we could take a poll on anything. And ain't none of y'all unanimously going to agree on anything. Let's talk about color. If I say the sky is blue, right then I have ticked off so many women in this room because there's more than one blue. There's, uh, there's you know, teal, light blue, sky blue, majestic blue. It's blue, okay, guys? Blue, purple, it's just we got like the six colors. That's what y'all are going to get. So how are you going to get 400 people to tell you unanimously, if you do this, it's going to be successful. That should be a massive red flag to you. The world is telling you, hey, you need to do this so you can have this. And they're all telling you, you need to do this. Buy my book, learn this, apply this to your life and you'll wake up a millionaire. It's not multi-level marketing. You just need to tell three people and then they need to tell three people. But as long as you do this and you follow my blueprint, you're gonna wake up next to, I almost say wake up next to Bill Gates, but I was gonna say wake up like Bill Gates. I hope you don't wake up next to Bill Gates. That's awkward for everybody. And then we're reading about you in the newspaper because you weren't supposed to be there. But he's like, I know, I, I know this is wrong. There's no way all these people should agree. And he says, is there no longer a prophet? Oh, I love that verse. Is there no longer a prophet of the Lord? Oh, that is a cry for the churches in America. You're up here filling people's heads with plenty of words. But is there no longer a prophet of the Lord in this house? Is there none in the churches in America? Where is God? Where is God? Because we've got all kinds of false doctrine. We've got all, fi- all kinds of false theology. We've got all kinds of just milking things the wrong way and talking about things the wrong way and twisting scripture the wrong way and sprinkling in a little bit of truth so you get a little church donut. And the problem is none of these people would stand if more of you and more of us We get on our knees and pray, but more than that, just read and know the word. Do you know how, do you know how they test money if it's fake? They don't study all the different ways that it can be fake. They study the original. Because if you study the original and you know the original well enough, you know when a fake is there. You just know something's off. So if you study his word enough, and it is in you enough, and it is deep within you, deep rooted and like a fire in your bones, you know when somebody stands up in front of you and says, it doesn't matter about the sin in your life. Something is off. It doesn't matter. God didn't make just man and woman. We weren't there. Something is off. But we're allowing compromise in our churches, and we're allowing this to take root into people's lives and instead of saying something about it we're just like denying it like it doesn't exist that doesn't go away 
It doesn't go away just because you don't think it's there. It goes away when we set against it. Like last week, put the church against the gates of hell. Get your boldness back in your life. Stand up and do something. Don't compromise your values. Don't compromise the gospel. Stand up for Jesus and he will always stand up and honor you. So, where is God? Where is God? There is still but one prophet. I'm not making the next three minutes. There's, I won't go long over it, but... I tried. I'll figure it out. I pro- it won't be less, like last week. Just a little more. Still, still one. There's still one. Are you going to be one of the remnant? Are you 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 one of the remnant? Why do I got to stir you up to shout it then? Let's be real. I'm not trying to stir up your emotions. But if I got to stir you up just to be bold enough to shout that you're one in church, surrounded by people that are like-minded with you, I'm not your coach when you're out outside of these doors. I'm not going to be there shouting at you, hey, tell that person about Jesus in the lunch line. Come on, be bold. (laughs) What are you doing when you're not here? Are you still one? Are you still going to live for this? Because I don't know about you guys, I would much rather if Jesus came back and we all went up into the clouds and there wasn't a few people sitting here going, oh, whoops. And now you've got to figure out how to do what I've been shouting at you all these weeks and months instead of just doing it now. That's the urgency of it. The urgency of it. But we relapse because we reject God's control. Because we want to be in control. That's why we fight with our spouses because we feel like we're losing control of a situation. But I want to show you something today. I'm jumping ahead. Let's go to Luke 22. Luke 22. And one more point while you're, while you're turning there. Uh, Micaiah. He was arrested for giving that word. He was arrested. Ahab didn't like it. And he even says, like, see, I told you so. Jehoshaphat, who should have stood up and said something. Because if y'all remember, Micaiah, last week in 17, was one of the people that he sent out to teach Judah. Where was he at for him? He was compromising because he was more worried about the alliance with Ahab. And Micaiah is thrown into jail over it. And we don't even know what happens. The story ends with him saying that Ahab is not going to return. The, the, it was used, the situation was used by God to judge Ahab. And he says, if you return, talking to Ahab, if you return, they'll know that I was lying that the word of the Lord was not with me. And that's it. We know Ahab goes, and maybe I'll pick this up next week, but he goes off and he dies. Joshua comes back defeated, and we'll see that later, but maybe I'll pick up the rest of 18 next week. But over here in Luke 22, because so often we get in the place of, okay, yes, we know we're rejecting God's control. We know we're rejecting what God wants over us. We know that try as we might, we just feel like we keep messing up and, and we're, it's so hard not to beat yourself up because you're sitting here working towards Jesus. But just because you have new faith doesn't mean the old feelings are gone. Right. That's, right. That's why when you go to quit drinking or smoking, you can't just quit cold turkey. Some people maybe, yes, but for others, it takes time. That's why there's, Jesus works from the inside out. Sanctification from the inside out. Okay? So in Luke 22, this is the last supper. I'm, I'm going to be in verse 31. During the last supper, they're having the last supper. And 
Jesus is talking to them and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you like wheat. Y'all, we are all like Job in some way. Satan was allowed to test Job. Everything fell apart. He lost his family, his house, his kids, everything. Do you know the story? He gets it all back and more, double. But we are allowed to be tested. The reason for that is because the false idea of, I'm not really gonna live my life for Jesus, but hey, right before I get in the car accident, I'm gonna be like, thank you, Jesus, just blah, 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 and then you know, I'll go to heaven. That's, that, that's not how that works. I don't know if you've ever been in an accident. You've got time for half of two words. Oh, Oh no. oh, no. Yes, Tanya, you're so sanctified. The rest of us are like, ah! Listen, I was driving one day in a bucket truck to come back to get something, and I went, the front passenger tire exploded uh, on a bucket truck. Those are big. I went from, thank God I was in the right lane, I went from the right lane to the grass faster than I could blink. And oh no was not the words that I was saying. <laughs> I, was, I don't think I said anything. I was just... Then you get done and you're like, oh. So, good luck trying to pray that prayer. Um, <laughs> so Satan is trying to sift all of us like wheat. So God can see where your faith is. Is it truly in him? Or is it just a fleeting feeling? Because you want to be blessed. Because you want to get to heaven. The whole goal is just to get to heaven, not to serve Jesus. Apply that to your marriage. You want to get real? Oh, my whole goal is to just get married and get laid. Too much? Well, that's what we're doing with Jesus. I just want to get to heaven, but I don't want to, I don't want to try to clean up. I don't want to stop uh, sinning. I don't want to stop cussing. I don't want to stop having sex before marriage. I don't want to stop looking at porn. Y'all get quiet when it's heavy, but it's real. Try it in your marriage. Hey, I'm not going to pour anything into you. You just give me the dessert and we'll move on. Good luck. I heard you (laughs) coughing back there. That ain't how it works. That's not how it works. But. And Jesus says right here, but. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. He is pleading in prayer. Jesus, he is still up there interceding on your behalf. And he is pleading in prayer that Peter's faith will not fail. And this is the Last Supper. Do we remember what happens after this? Peter denies Jesus. He compromises because he gets scared. You can put it back up. That your faith won't fail. And that next sentence. And when you have turned back. And when you have turned back, Jesus already knew that Peter would reject him, but he knew that he was already redeeming him. God, see, we want to hide our sin instead of handing it to God. I've dealt with this. Now I want to put it behind my back and I'll lash out and I'm going to point yours out. But I'm still holding this back here. Don't look at mine. If if yours looks worse than mine, I'm going to point it out. And I want to hide it from God. I don't want God to know what I was doing as if he can't see everything and he doesn't know my thoughts and I can just slip one by him. I want to hide my sin instead of realizing I could be made whole. I could be healed if I just take this and lay it at his feet and give it to him like he asked, like he already knows And that you probably will do at some point in the future, but you could save yourself a lot of the heartbreak and heartache if you would just do it now. Drop your pride and do it now. Confess your sin and your need for your Lord. 
and he will know and he will heal you and he will make you whole and he will deliver you because he loves you. Do you see that? And when you have turned back, you can take it off. Thank you. Ah, He knew. He knew Peter was going to sin and he still did it. You think he doesn't know yours? Not just what you've done, but what you'll do today and tomorrow. I know it's Labor Day. He knows what you're going to do. And of course, you're still going to slip up. You're still going to compromise at some point because you're not fully sanctified yet. But the, the reality is that while you keep compromising, he keeps calling. You keep rejecting him and he is still redeeming you. You've been busy rejecting him, but he has been busy redeeming you. Everything that you are trying to keep from him. And he's, re- he's trying to show you, can you see what I can give you? Can you see what I can give you? You've been so busy rejecting me and trying to live your life on your terms, in your control, in your hands. And if you would just lay it at my feet. Not just your eternity, that would be amazing. But your life here, now. Eternity doesn't just begin when you die. It's already here. You're already eternal. And eternal life begins when you accept Jesus. Not when you die, when you accept Jesus. And as long as you are living and breathing in on this side of the dirt, there is time to repent. There is time to turn back. But what I want to leave you with today, just like that, slow down and seek God. Because literally, while you have been rejecting him, he has been busy redeeming you. And I know we have the relapse. You can bring the lights down. We have the relapse and we fall into different types of temptation. And that's not the sin. The sin is acting on it and we're going to stumble. We're still going to stumble. All of us are going to stumble. It's just the sinful nature that, be, that started at the fall of man. But are you going to live your life defined by that identity? By your iniquity? Are you going to seek Jesus in his integrity and chase after him and chase what he wants for you? What he desires for you? Not just eternal life, but joy, kindness, peace, love. You don't know what you're missing without fully giving yourself to Jesus. And he is the only thing, the only person that can satisfy. And today, I just want us to realize that. There's the power of slowing down and seeking God. Not being in a rush because culture is so hurried. We got to get somewhere fast, fast, fast. We got fast food faith. And we want to pull up to the window. Hey, Jesus, can I get that? And then drive off. Here's your happy meal. What are you missing out on? You're settling for (laughs) dollar menu McDonald's when you could be having Texas Roadhouse cinnamon rolls and rare meat. Not meat (laughs) from McDonald's. But that's how we're applying that to our lives. Jesus, please do this, 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 this. And we don't just stop. God, I'm going into this board meeting. I don't know what I'm doing. God, I don't know how you want this sermon to come out, but I know you're going to meet me there. God, I got this job interview tomorrow. I don't know what to say, but I know that you're going to meet me there. God, my family is falling apart and I don't know what to do, but I know you're here with me. God, I know I messed up last night and I'm sorry, but I know you're here with me. And God, I'm probably going to mess up 
right after I finish this prayer, but I know that you are with me. And if we can just grasp and realize who we have in us, truly in us, and the power that comes with that, and the authority that comes with that, Apart from the, the change in your life, I wouldn't have to shout five times just to get y'all to shout. Boldness. Boldness. I have heard so much this week on new videos and everything just across the nation of boldness. Boldness. Rise up. There was a, 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 a street preacher in the UK, I think it was. And he's out there just boldly, and man, oh, it blessed me so much. There's a short little clip. I wish I could find it now and, and throw it on Facebook for y'all. Just a short little reel on TikTok. And this dude just out in the middle of a city, wherever, near a subway, I don't know, somewhere, and just boldly, calmly, but boldly talking about Jesus. Actually, I think I might have posted it. No, I posted a different one. And this man comes up. And his face is contorted. And he starts speaking to this guy. Getting in his face all nasty. He's like, I know your family. I know your grandmother. I know your grandfather. I know your father. I know your mother. It was literally a demon manifesting in this man. Some of y'all, that's just too much for you to grasp and you don't think that still happens, but it does, and it is. Come to grips with it. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Everything that happens in the physical started in the spiritual first. And this man, he stands up, the demon, and he's sitting there, I know your family, I know you, I know everything about you. Turn the microphone off. Stop speaking this or I will make this nation rise against you. The man doesn't stop. Doesn't stop. And eventually, not in that video, but later, he's been arrested several times and other things have happened. The nation literally came against him. The power that is against you. The reality of Satan's kingdom against you. This can happen, and it probably will happen the minute that you start preaching the truth. I gave that sermon last week, and Kelsey got (laughs) pulled over on the way home. I don't know why it didn't come after me, because she didn't say nothing. Huh? I wasn't speeding. That's a... But that's a reality. Darkness will come against you. (laughs) But do y'all know the scripture? Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So it doesn't matter what's coming against you. It can never stand up with who is in you. The nation, this demon made this nation rise up against this man. And he still hasn't stopped. That is where I need all of us. All of us. I can't help you when you're not here. There's too many of you. And you have too much going on. I can't live your life for you. I can sit up here and I can shout at you all day long. You've got to do something. We're running out of time. But if it doesn't change and you just rely on me to be your faith fuel, your faith food, and what I give you from here, that's just enough for you during the week. You're starving and you're dying and if Jesus sucked us up into heaven right now and the trumpet sounded you'll probably be left behind and newsflash it's really bad for those that are left behind matter of fact go home and watch the newest left behind movie the rise of the antichrist came out recently you want to see a picture of how it's going to happen watch that 
AI and all this other stuff, there's going to be so much that you're not going to know what to believe unless you bury your face in this book and learn it and apply it and keep this book of the law on your lips all day long. That's the only way you're going to navigate any situation in life. And for those of you that might be watching this after the fact, if you are one left behind, bury your face in this book. I don't even know if this sermon will be left behind. Because in the movie, as soon as the rapture happens, they shut down all the church YouTubes so people can't find the truth. The importance of knowing it before it's too late. The importance of marking it up, writing notes, leaving highlights, and posting it on social media so your friends and your family can know about it. So if they get left behind, they can go to your house and find your Bible and find the truth just because they can see what you were getting in Revelation when you were writing it down and highlighting. The importance. But we reject God. And it's just too much. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough time. No more sideline faith. No more sideline faith. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.